Hi everyone, uh, my name is Sara Jayakar. I'm the Senior Content Editor at the Academy of American Poets. I'm so excited to be here in conversation today with Kazim Ali, our guest editor for Poem A Day for August in 2021. Kazim, hi, how are you? Hi there, how are you doing? Good, good. Thanks so much for being here with me. I'm so excited. I know, it's really fun. We're cross-continental too. You're in New York, I'm in California. We're <laughs> reaching for each other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you reach for me, I'll reach for you. Uh, <laughs> how did you um, so let's kind of just get right started. Uh, how did you approach curating Fomade? Well, um, I was super excited by the opportunity, of course. Um, it's such a big platform and it reaches so many people who um, are you know, new to poetry, our poets themselves are interested in poetry. It's kind of a very broad audience. Um, and one thing I know is like oftentimes my friends on Facebook who are not poets and not connected to the poetry world will write and put Put, post up poems from Poem a Day. So I knew that it reaches a lot of people. And I really wanted to provide, there's so many exciting, um, there's so much exciting poetry being written in the United States today and so many exciting poets. I really, really wanted to feature new voices and or voices that like had not had a really broad reach of an audience and opportunity to have a platform like Poem a Day or even some established writers and writers who've been around for a while, but who I felt didn't have as big of an audience. So I really, one of the rules that Poem Day was given to me was with that, with, you know, we don't want to have people who'd been in the previous year to again be in it. And so there was sort of this, I was sent this list of people who'd already been in it and who'd been accepted by other editors. And I was said, you know, don't choose any of these people. I actually didn't want to include anybody who'd been in it before. I wanted to just include new voices. You know, 22 um, poets, I thought, I love, there are so many poets I love, I mean, I love, and I devoted to them, and they've, you know, but I thought if they've published books, a lot of books, and people know their work already, they don't need me to be promoting them. <laughs> I'd rather uh, really look for who's out there who's not being promoted. So. I've included incredible writers who published five and six books, but who I felt, you know, really didn't, didn't have like the broadest, you know, audience I could offer to them. I've, Im I've included, um, you know, very, very new people who've only maybe emerging writers who published maybe one single book that I think people should know more about. And I include a lot of people who haven't published books. And I included a lot of people whose work I found on my travels, you know, like, I remember going to into you know Portland, Oregon, some bookstore there, and there was like a little chapbook display, and there was a chapbook of it, this chapbook was like ten eight and a half by eleven pieces of typing paper stapled together. That was, and it said this book has been published in an edition of seventy. <laughs> you know, some intrepid poet who, you know, went to Kinkos or something and made a chapbook. And I love, I always love that chat book. So then I reached out on Facebook and I said, who knows, do you know who this person is? Does anybody, can anybody give me contact info for this poet? And I found them and I solicited them and said, ha they have a poem in there. And, um, you know, I want, I, I really just wanted to bring something new, something fresh, you know? And I do think like, I mean, although I wasn't, you know, I wasn't counting up numbers, but I did my best to curate a diverse list. I wanted to include black voices. I particularly wanted to include Asian American voices, especially older Asian American writers who maybe, you know, didn't, didn't get ex as much exposure that they should have gotten, <clears throat> according to me. So, um, so yeah, I did my best with the list. I tried to be queer inclusive. I really wanted to present a dynamic range of unexpected voices for everybody. Yeah, and you can see the dynamism when you read the full batch of August poems, which I think is gonna be a really thrilling month. You can completely see like the elasticity of thinking. Like I can't even, I can't even count the number of times that I was like shocked into like, um, <laughs> I was like shocked into like learning something about poetry, learning something about language, learning something about like the manipulation of, of language and also like presenting it to us 
these poems present language in its in its, its truest form. I, I don't know how else to put that. It's incredible. I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that. I really, really wanted to show a formal range as well. I didn't want to only have a certain kind of poem. I wanted to show the breadth of what people are doing right now. Yeah. Also, long live the poetry chapbook. Thank God. Yes. Yeah. It inspires me. I want to do some chat. I want to do chat books now. Too. Well, in my early, the early days of my poetic life, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Albany, um, I was a member of the student associations executive board. And one of the things that was my responsibility was supervising the facilities. So I had a key to what we, at the time, we called it the copy room. Yeah. That's where the, yes. That's where the, the Xerox machines were. And so now this young kids, they publish by putting their stuff on the web. Well, in those days, we used to make little pamphlets and zines and stuff like that. And so the copy machine could saddle staple. So we would have to lay out the poems like in the order of the page numbers that we wanted them and like write the page numbers. And then we'd run them through and with a cover and saddle staple them. And then we'd sell them, like we'd go on the quad and sell them. And we would have like, I mean, we would have grocery money or we would have yeah. drinks money. Yeah, we would do, oh. so me and my friends, we used to do that. So, so um, there is uncounted, uh, if it still exists, it might've been, just, they might've all been destroyed by now, but there are uncounted, chat books and ephemera and broadsides of my work floating around Albany, New York. <laughs> Every once in a while, something pops up on Amazon and I quickly buy it up. <laughs> but unfortunately, I've been driving the price up. So now everyone thinks they're collector's items. <laughs> and it's getting harder and harder for me to buy them up. So. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, the magic of the Xerox machine, man. I remember like just yeah. like, we like had like an aggregate, like a network, no matter like what, town you were in or city you were in, somebody knew somebody who had access to a Xerox. Oh, I mean, that's how Soft Skull Press started. Yeah. Sander, Hicks, Sander Hicks, who was this, who founded it, worked at a, a Kinko's or a something and was just Xeroxing books at night, like on the machines. Thank God. Yeah, and Karen Lillis as well, under an underground uh, uh, lit fiction writer um, based in Pittsburgh. She got, she got her start doing the same thing. It was, she pirated, she would publish these pirate editions of her own novels and stories on uh, using Kinko's or wherever it was she was working. I don't remember. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those yeah. were the days. <laughs> <laughs> they continue to be the days. I advise yeah. you, watch her. Find a Xerox machine. Yeah, but all this underground publishing, like the black writers of the of the uh, black arts movement, Third World mm -hmm. Press, it was this all community presses people started. The way in the early days of women feminist publishing, it was the same. The early days of queer publishing in the early, you know, late 60s, early 70s, when the, the kind of queer renaissance of queer literature, they were all the mainstream publishers like that were not publishing that stuff. Maybe Grove was, um, but you know, the other corporate presses were not. It was all underground, um, mm -hmm. self-funded community, kitchen table press, women of color, you know, started. And um, yeah, that's how, that's how all of these new voices got out in the publishing world. We're through, we're through community presses. Yeah. Often underground, often very lo-fi, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that's what makes them so beautiful. That oh yeah. Yeah. And like the way that copy machines like fuzz text out as you copy them more. I know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, from copy to copy to copy. Yeah. yeah. So you had to have originals. You had to have the master copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And when we had to cut and paste for layout, we were actually cutting mm -hmm. and pasting <laughs> like physically to like move things around and stuff. I wish I had like my, my little zine library and it's like the way, and like that also, it like, revolutionizes the way that you present art on books. It revolutionizes the way that you like think about materials of bookmaking. Like yeah. the possibilities are so spectacularly endless. Um, poem a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, poem a day is a version of that. You've given me a platform to promote the writers that I would love to get out there. So it was a real gift to be able to do it. Yeah, oh, thank you for saying yes. It's been a gift to have you. <laughs> So if you could direct readers to one poem on our collection at poets.org uh, that you haven't curated, what would it be and why? Well, I chose the poem Zanana by Noor Henby, which was one of the uh, university and college 
poetry prizes in 2019, I'm told. Um, and the poem itself is, um, Z so Zanana is, an, as, she, as, as Noor explains in her epigraph, um, it is, a, it is means, roughly translated means buzz, the buzz that an insect makes. And it's the term that Gazan people have given to the Israeli drone aircraft, um, which, are, which are not only, you know, uh, we're not only talking about uh, weapons fire in Gaza, but, but the surveillance as well, surveillance drones. So they're part of daily life there. And she wrote this beautiful uh, um, poem, that begins with the image of a hummingbird flapping its wings and the word zanana is also the word for that and it's this exploration of the juxtaposition between finding beauty in the daily life amidst this um you know walled city which is you know either considered by some to be the largest open air prison in the world um although i heard an israeli peace activist refer to it as the largest research and development installation for military and surveillance technology in the world, which is also what it is. Mm -hmm. Because every weapon that is used in the strip is then marketed and sold to the militaries of the world. Mm -hmm. And so Noor's poem is beautifully used as the metaphor of the hummingbird's wings to talk about what daily life is for people in such an environment mm -hmm. and how they even there find grace. Oh. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. Hi. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a whole lot. Yeah. And Noor is one of the really wonderful, what Noor, Noor Hindi is one of many um, younger Palestinian American writers who are really, you know, George Abraham is another, mm -hmm. um, Tarek Lutun is another. There's, a, you know, a, there's several, a bunch. They're really stepping up and, um, you know, addressing this uh, um, situation in Gaza, but also around the world and the impact of the occupation um, in beautiful ways in their art and their writing. So this is one of Noor's pieces that happens to be on your poets.org website, but there are many, she's got a couple of other pieces out there that I hope people will look for. Mm. And then when I think about, especially with Palestinian writing, especially with queer writing, like when I think about the way that, um, and Paul Trans actually said this so beautifully in an event that we recently co-sponsored about Yayoi, Yayoi Kusama's work. Mm -hmm. um, and Paul said that like the way that Kusama invites, like ushers in a world from which you are able to live having experienced trauma in your past, right? Like you create no. this world, you usher in this world where your body can thrive. Yeah. And it's like, it's not poetry that re-traumatizes you. It is poetry that shows you that not only is the future possible, the future is here and we're in it. Like it, it has to be real because we are able to make this art, right? Yeah. Like, it's so I mean beautiful. Yeah, and I think everything you said is absolutely applicable to, um, you know, to artists who live under occupation, exactly. specifically Palestinian artists. I mean, this is the reality of life there is, you know, how do you, how do you make a life under so, such conditions and continue forward and make art and make songs and make poetry and teach your children and, you know, do all of those things, those ordinary things. Um, things of life, they don't cease. You yeah. just have to find out how to do them while the world is falling down around you. Yeah. People don't stop making art because there's a war happening. They might make more. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Yes. In her poem, Grief Work, why not now go towards the things I love? My God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, what else are you reading right now? Um, well, I'm super excited. I'm reading a bunch of, uh, I don't know, one says like scholarship or literary, literary criticism. It sounds too dry, um, but I'm reading Anahid Narcessian's beautiful book on Keats's odes. Um, 
I think it's called Keats's Odes, A Lover's Discourse. So it's halfway between scholarship and very personal engagement. I'm also reading um, Alexandra Sosaridis' beautiful book called Dickinson Unbound, Paper, Process, and Poetics. And it's about um, Dickinson's materials and how she shifted and changed when she was working on like loose paper, when she was working in the, the fascicles, so-called fascicles, when she was working in on the scraps, um, all of that kind of stuff. And, and um, Sosaritis is a kind of thesis is that, uh, that the materials impact, you know, do the poems, are the poems like press the materials in service or does the materials enable the poems? This is a question that visual artists ask all the time and critics of visual art have just talked about. That's part of a history of like, you know, how, how, does, how does art get made? And so she's now finally applying that kind of same line of thinking to Dickinson's pra material practice. So I think that's really interesting. I'm excited to read it. And then Marta Werner, who's another great textual scholar of Dickinson doing really interesting creative work. She's the one who collaborated with Jen Banka to do The Gorgeous Nothings, which was the big uh, exploration of Dickinson's writings on ephemera, including envelopes, backs of envelopes, jam jar labels, all those late writings um, that, that Marta Werner calls the open folios. So she's been working on that for the last 25 years, but her new book is called Writing in Time. And it's specifically about what she calls the master documents. Um, there are three letters, of course, in Dickinson's papers that are called the master letters, but Marta Werner adds two more documents, two more poems to that and calls them, the, those five are called the master documents. And so this is a big, kind of like coffee table like book with timelines of the text fold out and stuff like that Whoa. and it has photostat represent um, representations of the master letters themselves and then um, marta werner's analysis and discussion of the material practices so this is what you know academic poets read on their break big, ah. big, big, big geeky <laughs> uh geeky stuff but I'm also reading a bunch of other like unre unrelated to literature um, stuff for my new uh, writing project, which is a nonfiction project, actually not related to poetry. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. I, I love books that you can interact with that are about interaction. Yeah. That's yeah. So good. Like um, yeah. cookbooks are really like that. Um, yeah. Samin Nasrat's book like has a lot of like pull out sheets and like oh I have to get that book I love her I met her in San Francisco at a fundraiser and we just this was way before it was before Cook, Cooked came out it was before her show it was like this was like not quite 10 years ago and I knew that she was going to be big you know because she's just so generous so beautiful so passionate about her work we hit it off we hit it we met at this reception and we really hit it off and then she took me to a restaurant she's like we're going to this restaurant and you know Chinese restaurant she said what kind of food do you like the most I said Chinese food she said okay we're gonna go to a real Chinese restaurant and I said I know but I also I'm vegetarian and so you know, we can't, you know, she said, don't worry about it. We went into one of those restaurants that is like not really like a very known tourist type of restaurant, but like more for the community. And they all knew her and it was all like off the menu stuff. You know, she was like, well, we're going to get this. The, can you do that other thing? You know, it was so great. And all this food came out and it was what a night we had. It was really nice. And then of course she became like, later I saw like my partner loves cooking shows. He's watching Netflix and he's like, you gotta watch this show. And I'm like, I think I know that girl. Ah, <laughs> I remember yeah. watching that show. I was, where the, where even was I? I, I don't, I can't remember my life before I saw her on TV. <laughs> I I are you her. are you um are you part Iranian? Are you any Iranian? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm like only only South Indian. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So seeing this like seeing this truly lovely, like expressive, they see person talking about food in the way that so many of us talk about poetry with our whole bodies. Oh yeah, whole fully breath, passionately. It's and totally so breaking it down, like explaining, yes. this is why food, this is what we love about food, right? Salt, heat, fat, like just explaining it. It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> it's so good. I love it. Blessings. Thank God. Thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So what are you currently working on now in your writing, teaching, and publishing life? Well, I'm just finishing up some tea. I mean, I've taught a beautiful course this year that I loved that I'm hoping to turn the lectures into essays and maybe it will be a book. I don't really know. Um, but it's, it was on the lyric, the, it's on the postmodern lyric, which I think is my jam. That's what I love to read. That's what I love to write. And um, I'm not gonna be teaching for a couple of years. I got elected chair of my department yes, <laughs> yeah. yes not just the creative writing side the whole entire giant literature department so i'm really going to be focusing on that for at least a year i'm not going to teach then i'll probably start teaching again next year on a limited basis while because i'll be chairing for three years so there's that but my creative projects are going really well i published a book of poetry and a book of nonfiction this both this year and I've also been working for the long time. I've been working the book of poetry that I published this year. I wrote, I finished in 2017. The, you know, it takes a long time then to get it published. But since 2017, I've been working on new poems. So I actually just finished what I think should be my next book. Um, and it's out with, you know, being looked at and we'll see what happens with that. But my, I'm turning my attention now to my new nonfiction project. That's what I'm going to work on over the summer. I spent about five years traveling uh, back and forth. I know I wasn't living there, but I spent about a five-year period going to the West Bank, to the Palestinian territory of the West Bank, specifically Ramallah, which mm -hmm. is the administrative capital and not very far from Jerusalem, about 20 kilometers away from Jerusalem in the highlands though. And so I was there teaching yoga at a yoga studio and um, eventually started training yoga teachers there. Mm -hmm. So I've trained uh, a bunch of yoga teachers who are now all offering classes. And I wanted to write a book about my own journey with yoga and that experience of going to Palestine and teaching yoga and training Palestinian yoga teachers. So that's my next project. I, it's sitting here, the draft is sitting right here. There's a draft, I have to work on it though. It's a messy draft, but this is it right here. Yes! Yeah, there's about 330 pages of it. So, it, and it's a, it's a mess, it's a hot mess. It's nothing, it's not presentable, you know, it's terrible. That's how I work, you know, just get it, get it down on paper and then worry about it. So now I've got to, I'm, in, I'm planning on spending the summer with this book and trying to get it into shape. That's incredible. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And I feel very, I mean, it's like everything that's happening in the world today and that, you know, the, you know, in continuing incursions in Gaza and the Islamophobia here, you know, this horrible event just happened yesterday in Canada as well, you know, the Muslim family. And so I just, I feel so, um, I've been dealing, you know, the Islamophobia has been there since like, you know, ever, you know, because I grew up in the 80s and I remember how terrible it was then. And half the plots of those films, you know, you know, True Lies is a famous example, but um, uh, what's it called? Movie. Um, you truly even, not watch a single movie. Yeah. No, no, they were all about the villainous Arabs, you know, yeah. that's been like coded and baked into the DNA for so long. Back to the Future, remember the villain? Yeah, were, oh my yeah. God. It's in the first like 10 minutes of yeah. this movie. Yeah, yeah. And that show Dynasty, remember? Yeah. The original plot of Dynasty was like the Arabs had stolen all of Blake Carrington's money. The Arabs, you know? what do you mean? Yeah, the Arabs, yeah. They're, because they all agree with each other. You know, it's like, yeah. So that, that you know, horrible kind of hatred has been very, very baked into American culture. And I think no doubt at all the former president, disgraceful man that he was, lit like lit a powder keg of flame, sort of like uh, made it acceptable to be like to do horrible things, you know. So, uh, but but the but the fuel was there all along. And it's like when you have state saying when you're when you are literally as the state villainizing a people whatever that people whoever that people fully is. fully and all the into anti-asian violence that's happening now is from those years of of his you know uh, irresponsibly fanning the flames around exactly. uh, covid and all of that stuff you know exactly yeah and governments are like oh we're so sorry and i'm like don't act surprised yeah. you, you did this yeah i think you're right i do i do um yeah 
I'm really excited for your work to continue to exist in this world. So thank you for everything thank that you, you do. Well, um, thank you for everything that you are doing as well. <laughs> you're playing a very important role and you're, you're getting poetry out there to people. And I'm assuming, I don't know, are you a writer also? Oh, yeah. Well, so yeah. then you have to be doing your own work too and creating a balance for yourself. You know, you cannot only focus on the external. You have to do what's right inside as well. Yeah. So... I had a really wonderful um, conversation with Olga Brumas, and she said that Odysseus Elites, the great um, Greek poet who she translated, um, Elites said to her, um, a truly great poet only needs three readers. And since any poet worth his salt has at least two devoted friends, his entire career then becomes the search for that third reader. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. And I've held that close, very, very close all these years. I've always felt I just want one person to really get me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're out there. They're yeah. out there. They're out there. They might exist. There might be many of them, but yeah. I feel like it takes pressure off of thinking, what am I doing? Who really cares about it? Is it important? Am I important? It's sort of like those things are natural for a human to wonder about, but it's, it's, it's excess. It's stuff that you don't really need. Yeah. I love the word excess. I love the word excessive. Well, I am often told by young people that I am extra. <laughs> 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 my nephews and my niece that will say, you're so extra. And I think, yes, that is, that is what I am. I you're am welcome. Extra. <laughs> I'm extra. There's not enough of me. Yeah. It will always be extra. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for speaking with me. This was so nice. Thank you. Thank you for chatting. Did we do all the questions? I think so, yeah. Um, now we just say bye, I think. All right. Well, bye. Well, I hope that everyone enjoys <laughs> the poems that I selected for the month. There's going to be something new every day. There's going to be brand new voices that you've never heard before. There's going to be some old familiar friends popping up. Um, and my greatest hope is that for each poet, when you read the poem on Poem A Day, that you be motivated, if you see something you love, that you be motivated to seek out that poet's work and see what they're about, see what they're doing. If it's something who hasn't, someone who hasn't published a lot, then I hope you'll follow them and see where they go because there are a bunch of young people on there um, and who have not published a book yet and you are gonna wanna remember their name. Thank mm -hmm. you.